When I'm making this video, it's now been just over a week since the legendary 2024 total solar eclipse, one of the most fascinating astronomical events of the last few years. And so I figured it would be a perfect time to do a kind of a general debrief, focusing on some of the most unusual discoveries so far, and also some of the more unusual images captured from various perspectives. And although we've discussed a lot of this during the stream on April 8th, the link for which you can find in the description below, today I wanted to focus on some of the things most people basically missed or might have been not aware of. And also talk about some of the first discoveries that were made during the eclipse. And I think the biggest one is actually right here. A discovery of a comet Soho 5008. A comet that was discovered by several amateur astronomers and actually picked up by the NASA's solar observatory known as SOHO, which is why it's called SOHO 5008. And the number here might also be a bit of a hint. This is the 5008th comet discovered by SOHO and pretty much all of them were extremely close to the Sun. These are known as the Sun Grazer comets and most of these comets only get discovered really close to the Sun and actually only survive for a few hours. And this comet was no exception. It was essentially discovered, observed, and then disappeared all within approximately 12 to 20 hours. Mostly because these comets pass extremely close to the Sun, usually just a few million kilometers away from the surface, or at least 10 times closer than Mercury to the Sun. And these comets are surprisingly very common. And they're often discovered during eclipses because it's usually the only way for us to physically see what's hiding near the Sun without being blinded by its extreme luminosity. But officially some of the first Sun grazers were discovered back in 1882 by a group of early astronomers observing the eclipse in Egypt. And during this time, a German astronomer, Heinrich Krutz, was actually able to discover that a lot of them seemed to have an extremely similar orbit, as if they came from the same object. And so today we refer to them as Kreutz Sun Grazers, and many of them are believed to be tiny fragments of a much larger comet that was possibly observed by Aristotle back in 371 BC. And that comet basically broke apart, creating smaller pieces that are now orbiting in a very eccentric orbit that you sort of see right here. And once in a while, one of them approaches really close to the Sun, gets smaller or even gets destroyed, and if it survives, it disappears again for a few thousand years. And so SOHO has been discovering a lot of these with pretty much very similar orbits, sort of confirming this hypothesis that they all came from the same body with this piece being the most recent. But one of the most impressive pieces was seen in 1965. This was Comet Ikea Seki that was actually one of the brightest comets of the 20th century. And so chances for another one are actually pretty high. Because there are so many fragments that are still in orbit, here it's just a matter of waiting for a large enough piece to approach the Sun. But intriguingly, the comet that everyone was waiting for, 12P or Pons Brooks, visible in this beautiful image by Jan Eric Velestad, was nowhere to be seen. For some reason, it was not actually that easily visible, and so I couldn't actually find any incredible images of this, because I guess most researchers focused on a newly found comet, Soho 5008. But this comet is actually really interesting because it's sometimes known as the Devil Comet, and is technically a cryovolcano. But I guess because it was kind of far away from the Sun, the only way to take a photo of it would be by using some kind of a wide field lens. And so anyway, no super cool pictures, at least for now but we have some really, really cool shots from outer space. Here's a time lapse showing us the passage of the shadow, moving at over 2000 km per hour, captured by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration satellites that are usually responsible for studying things like hurricanes. And here's an even more awesome shot from ESA. And this is, to me at least, absolutely mind-blowing. You can actually see this huge, creeping darkness approaching North America just before it swallows everything and then disappears. And so yeah, no wonder the Mayans and the other ancient civilizations were so terrified of this. It does look kind of scary. And in this case, this was captured by a geostationary satellite, GOES-16, from approximately 36,000 kilometers away. But this wasn't just to make a cool video, this was actually scientific as well. Here, this is an ongoing study that doesn't actually have any publications yet, in regards to environmental changes during the eclipses, focusing on temperature changes cloud cover changes, and various pressure changes in the upper atmosphere. We still don't really have details on what's up here, but these studies are going to be coming out really soon. And so make sure to subscribe, because we'll talk more about this very soon.
Then we had more shots from other satellites, such as Discover or Deep Space Climate Observatory, but I guess this one is maybe not as impressive. But then we also had a few shots from the International Space Station. Here's a picture, this was captured by the NASA's camera on the ISS. Here is another shot capturing Quebec and New Brunswick in Canada, with a part of the resupply spacecraft visible here as well. Here's a slightly different angle, where you pretty much see the entire shadow. But here is something that was actually taken, I guess, by accident. This is a shot from one of the Starlink satellites by SpaceX that was able to capture the footage of the Moon's shadow as it was orbiting Earth. And this actually looks absolutely awesome as well. Although what's intriguing in this particular video is that it seems to be wobbling a little bit. There's a bit of a shaking going on, which I'm guessing is a result of the motion of the solar panels, making the video vibrate just a little bit. Or maybe something here is broken and they need to take a look at this. Either way, an amazing shot and something that we've never seen before. But interestingly, that shot from the International Space Station was technically planned. NASA has been gradually moving the International Space Station so that it would actually pass through the solar eclipse, experiencing approximately 90% totality, but also changing the orbit in order to avoid certain space junk. We'll talk more about this in some of the future videos. Either way though, there have definitely been so many gorgeous shots. And quite a lot of them came from various NASA scientists, like the one that you see right here. By the way, all of the links and all of the credits are also in the description below. But here's actually a really cool video of the NASA pilot collecting the data while flying through the eclipse at a ridiculously high altitude at nearly 60,000 feet. Flying on one of the NASA's scientific airplanes, known as WB-57, High Altitude Research Aircraft. And here the mission was to study the upper atmosphere once again. No actual results yet, but the data has been collected, so it's just a matter of time. And then there were obviously quite a lot of different images and pictures from the ground as well. Here's one showing us a very common phenomenon known as solar prominence. Huge loops of plasma that are actually several times larger than planet Earth, produced by various magnetic effects on the Sun. Now, some people were actually able to see this during the totality as well, but in most cases you had to have some kind of a telescopic lens. This one was captured by one of the NASA scientists, Keegan Barber. And there were quite a lot of shots of these prominences from different angles, but they weren't really as large as before in some of the previous eclipses, because for some reason, to everyone's surprise, even though this is basically the peak of solar activity, on that day, the sun decided to be somewhat quiet and produce almost no emissions at all. And so the prominences are basically kind of small. Here's actually another cool shot by the same photographer. And here you can even see the magnetic lines extending inside the corona, producing these very beautiful streaks. But in most cases, almost everyone saw another really cool phenomenon, the Bailey's beads. The unusual streaks usually visible on the moon which are actually a result of lunar landscape and specifically mountains and ridges as they let some of the light from the sun through, forming these unusual speckles. And this is very often mistaken for different solar emissions or even solar flares. But this is a completely different phenomenon. You can actually learn more about this in one of the previous videos in the description. Here's another cool shot from Texas by the same photographer. And then we had the launch of three sounding rockets, one of which you see right here, that essentially went into the upper atmosphere and then into the ionosphere in order to study the effects solar eclipses usually have on the ionosphere or even the magnetosphere of the planet. In this case, the data has also been collected, just not processed yet, and so we don't really have any conclusions, but we know that the mission was a success. All of these three rockets launched half an hour apart, returned and collected enough data. But then we also had some unusual reports pretty much a day or two after the eclipse. Turns out that hours and days after the eclipse, there were millions and millions of internet searches on Google looking for the term, my eyes hurt. So yeah, I guess people didn't really listen to advice and looked directly at the sun after all. Even though so many of us have been continuously warning everyone not to do it. I mean, technically you can look at the sun for maybe four minutes during the totality, but even that is a bit risky. And so here they've probably all gotten what's known as solar retinopathy. Essentially damage to retina as a result of exposure to extreme brightness. And the thing is normally there's no pain, mostly because that part of the eye does not have any nerve fibers. But the eyes afterwards do get inflamed and that's where minor pain may start. Luckily though, this is not a permanent problem and can technically disappear after a few weeks, maybe a few months. Although in some cases it can be permanent. So yeah, don't look at the sun, unless you are a telescope specifically designed for this. Such as this beautiful telescope you see right here, known as Daniel Inouye Solar Telescope 
located in Hawaii. And it too was able to take an incredible shot of the sun. Now this is something I've never seen before, and this looks absolutely incredible. But this does have a purpose. This is actually really important for the telescope. Here the data was acquired in order to calibrate optical systems and instruments in the telescope itself. Because the telescope here has to usually correct for the very turbulent atmosphere of planet Earth, and it usually employs what's known as adaptive optics, this was a perfect opportunity to calibrate the optics by using this beautiful shadow and of course the sun itself. And what's really awesome about this shot is, well, you even get to see tiny mountains on the moon. As you can see, this is not a perfectly straight line, and it shows us the rugged surface of the moon. This is really, really awesome. Probably one of the best shots I've seen of the moon during the eclipse. But obviously, apart from looking at the moon and looking at the sun, some people observing the eclipse also realized something around them started changing as well. As we've discussed previously, during the eclipse, usually the air becomes much colder, even dropping by up to 10 degrees, and the winds, as well as clouds, can completely disappear. And this is apparently something that a lot of my friends in Canada witnessed as well. As soon as the eclipse started, they all had to put on jackets and it became really cold. But one of the strangest effects we observed during the eclipse is what's known as the Purkinje effect. It's essentially how we perceive colors, and specifically the vibrance of colors, in different light conditions. And so a lot of colors that are usually vibrant in daytime become extremely dark and barely visible. And vice versa, some colors that are normally not very easily visible become extremely bright, transforming everything around us. Now it's actually a little bit difficult to explain this without really seeing it, but this is a very well-known effect, and we'll probably discuss this in some of the future videos, because the actual explanation is a little bit more complex, and there's a lot of physiology behind it. But it wasn't just colors people were looking at, a lot of people were also trying to look at animals, mostly for different scientific studies that were being conducted during this time. And that's because different teams, including the team from NASA, wanted to actually figure out how various animals react to solar eclipses, and what effects these particular events might have on different types of life. And once again we had some really unusual results from various zoos around the planet. Now this is very preliminary, and I'm sure there will be more that we'll talk about later, but for example, in one of the zoos in Texas, quite a lot of different animals, gorillas, tortoises, elephants, bonobos, mistook eclipse for nighttime and basically went inside their enclosure getting ready to sleep. And strangely enough, this behavior was different from what was observed from similar animals during previous eclipses, such as the one in 2017. And this also applied to most of the birds in the zoo, but not all birds and not all animals. Flamingos, as well as zebras, giraffes and chimps, suddenly changed their behavior either running around or patrolling around, or even coming together for safety, as if they were super stressed and had a lot of anxiety. Whereas other birds, such as waterfowl, suddenly quieted down for at least 4 minutes, and as soon as the eclipse was finished, one of them suddenly started making loud noises, with a lot of birds then joining in, as if it was suddenly morning. There was even at least one ostrich that for some reason laid an egg, right in the middle of the eclipse. Nobody knows why, but it did seem to happen. And so quite a lot of observations from several zoos, such as the one in Vermont and one in Quebec, reported on a lot of unusual behavior in various species. Then there was some really strange behavior in Japanese macaques. For some reason, all of them completely stopped their interaction, turned their backs to the sun, and just stayed calm, sitting down, doing nothing for 5 minutes, returning back to their normal routine as soon as the eclipse was finished. And this is not at all what the researchers expected them to do. For example, previously, in other macaques or even baboons, the most common behavior was pointing, screaming, and basically being anxious. So yeah, these macaques were possibly not impressed. But basically most animals, even goats, had some kind of a reaction. In case of goats, for example, they all started moving around and shuffling for approximately 5 minutes as well, but then stopped and returned to their normal routine as soon as the eclipse was finished, with some animals basically doing the opposite of what they usually do during daytime. For example, cranes, which are normally very vocal, were completely quiet for 5 minutes with the only animal that didn't seem to care at all once again being a bear. None of the bears did anything different, and they all just basically did whatever they were doing before. And this is something that was observed in every single case for many, many years. Bears don't seem to do eclipses. But what about the most complex animal of them all? Us. Well, I'm sure there will be more studies coming out about all of this in the next few months, 
but one of the first unusual discoveries was really surprising. There was an enormous drop of internet use during this time. Nationwide it was by about 8% in total, but in places like Vermont that experienced one of the coolest eclipses ever, it was by up to 60%, which basically suggests that humans stopped what they were doing and went outside to look at the eclipse for at least 5 minutes, but in most cases actually up to an hour. Making this one of the most important events of the last few years, and for quite a lot of people, quite a transcendental experience that they're going to remember for their whole life. And so yeah, super cool event, with the next one in 2026 being in Spain, Iceland and Greenland. So maybe I'll be there, hopefully, I don't know. Anyway, on that note, we'll come back and talk more about additional discoveries in some of the future videos. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow and as always, bye bye.